In this ICFD++ example, we're going to demonstrate the condensation of water vapor steam in two different Laval nozzles using the new Integral Computational Multiphysics Advanced User Interface, or ICMP AUI. Before diving into this example, I will briefly cover the new features and components of the ICFD++ AUI for the first time user. For a more in-depth understanding of the ICMP AUI features common across all Metacomp software, please click on the ICMP AUI demo link popping up on the left side of the video or refer to the ICMP AUI section of your ICFD++ documentation. This ICFD++ interface is composed of the menu bar, where the mouse is currently moving, the toolbar, which has the shortcuts to the commonly used functions and visualization controls, the canvas, in which a geometry or solution is displayed, and the notebook, currently showing that you are in a CFD++ simulation setup mode. Within the notebook, ICFD++ has its action tree, or setup wizard, which will guide you logically through the various steps of the problem setup, and one or more information trees, in this case the groups and boundary families tree, and the boundary conditions tree, corresponding to each item or step in an action tree is its action panel where the user is given the relevant choices based upon choices made in previous and current panels. All panels are dockable and resizable. In this example the condensation of water vapor in a sub-atmospheric stagnation pressure nozzle is simulated and the results are compared to experimental and numerical results. The use of the Eulerian dispersed phase condensation module in CFD++ is demonstrated. For this case, the entire nozzle is filled only with steam, water vapor, and no other species exist in the gas. First, we will identify the working directory. Once this has been selected, we will press OK at the bottom of this action panel to proceed. Next, in the load input grid info action panel, we will say yes to analyzing the grid files and reading in the BC family file. We'll press OK at the bottom of this action panel to proceed. Once the grid analysis has completed, a grid information panel will pop up, giving information about the grid that's been loaded in. This particular grid is a 2D grid with approximately 8900 quadrilateral cell elements and four boundary selectors. We can press OK at the bottom to close this panel. Next we are taken to the Cell Types and Volumes action panel. The inputs for this panel have automatically been entered based on the grid analysis done in the previous step. So we can press OK at the bottom to proceed. In the General Problem Definition action panel, we will choose to solve a general fluid problem and we will not be using any sort of preset problem class wizard so we'll keep that option as no and press OK at the bottom of the action panel to proceed. Next in the CFD problem definition panel for the fluid type we will be choosing multiple phases. The fluids will be miscible so we'll keep that as yes. For the secondary phase we will be using the Eulerian dispersed phase model only so we will choose dispersed phase only. The primary phase fluid will be gas and there will only be a single primary phase species. The primary phase flow will be compressible, we'll keep that as yes. The type of gas will be real gas and the flow speed will be mostly above Mach 0.5. The flow will be viscous, so we'll keep that as yes. The flow will also be turbulent, so we will also keep that option as yes. There will be no radiation heat transfer in this problem, so we will keep this option at the default no. The type of simulation will be a steady state computation. Once these inputs have been entered, we can press OK at the bottom to proceed. We will not be applying any additional specifications for this problem. So we can keep all of these options at their default no state and press OK at the bottom to proceed. In the equation properties action panel, 
the equation of state for the primary phase we will choose as ideal gas. We will keep the default two equation realizable K epsilon turbulence model. We will not be having any passive scalars, so we'll keep that as no. The dispersed phase model, we will choose Eulerian dispersed phase. We will only have a single dispersed phase species, so we'll keep that as the default one. For the additional equations for the EDP, we will choose energy and number density, since we will be having phase change. We will not be turning on the diffusivity for the EDP, so we'll keep that as no. Once these settings have been applied, we can press OK at the bottom to proceed. We will not be applying any physics source terms to this problem, so we can keep that at the default no and press OK at the bottom to proceed. In the reference quantities action panel, we are told that we will be running this case in dimensional mode and in SI units. We will accept these options and press OK. In the fluid properties panel for the primary phase, we will choose two temperature ranges for our species. Our primary phase species will be water vapor, so we will scroll down the database to find H2O water. We will highlight it with a single left mouse click and then holding down the left mouse button we will drag and drop this to our hidden species tree and that will be our sole primary phase species in this problem. Once this is set we can press OK at the bottom to confirm and proceed. Next in the Eulerian dispersed phase properties action panel. For the fluidized density reference value based on, we will choose whole volume. For the dispersed phase properties, we will highlight the sole dispersed phase species with a single left mouse click. And then we will press the edit button at the top. This will bring up a dispersed species information panel. This species will be liquid water. The type of particle will be set to liquid. We will not have evaporation, radiation, or breakup or wall impingement applied. The specific heat of formulation will be kept as constant. We will keep all values in their constant state except for the initial particle diameter. We will set this to 1e minus 9 meters. This initial particle size is set to a number that is lower than the initial expected particle sizes in the system and has no effect on the solution as long as it is lower than the initial nucleation droplet size. Once that's been changed, we can press OK to confirm and close this panel. Next, we will choose to activate the condensation model and we will press OK at the bottom to confirm and proceed. Since we had activated the condensation model in the previous panel, we will be taken to the condensation model inputs action panel next. The growth rate of a droplet can be attained from two different expressions, the hertz newton expression or the Jaramathy expression. For this particular problem, we will choose the Jaramathy. In regard to condensation of pure steam flowing through a supersonic nozzle, the Jaramathy model predicts more accurate droplet size the condensation model we will choose will be specific to water. We will allow the droplet sizes to vary, so we will say no to constant droplet size. We will not be turning off the nucleation term, and we will not be allowing for droplet coagulation, so we'll keep that as no. We will not allow the droplet size to be based on supercooling temperature ratio. The Newton number parameter for convective heat transfer we will set to a constant value. In the Jaramathy expression, droplet growth rate is obtained from an energy balance around a spherical particle, where the convective heat transfer coefficient is modified to account for Newton number effects due to the small droplet size. The calculation of saturation temperature we will choose to be based on internal fits for water. We will choose to include non-isothermal effects in the nucleation term, and we will keep all other options in their default state 
before pressing OK at the bottom to confirm and proceed. For the initial conditions, we will initialize the entire domain using a temperature-based information set. With the primitive variables tree highlighted, we will add a new information set underneath by pressing the plus button. Once a new information set has been created, we will highlight it with a single left mouse click, as well as checking it to confirm that we will be using this for our initial conditions. The static pressure we will set to 2.5 E4 pascals. The static temperature we will set to 354.6 Kelvin. And the initial X velocity we will set to 300 meters per second. We will keep the K and Epsilon values in their default states as we will initialize them at a later stage of the setup. We will not have any water droplets initially, so we'll keep all the E to P values for our single species at zero. Once this is set, we will press OK at the bottom to confirm and proceed. Before we proceed to applying the boundary conditions, I would like to go over some of the basic controls of the AUI. If you move your mouse cursor to the canvas, holding down the right mouse button will allow you to zoom in and out. Holding down the middle mouse button will allow you to translate. And the left mouse button will allow you to rotate. Going to the shortcut buttons, I will choose to go back to the XY view since we are in a 2D grid. We can toggle the 2D grid on and off in the canvas by clicking on the toggle 2D button. In the boundary families tree, we can choose to hide and show the boundary families with a single left mouse click on the grid icon next to each boundary family. Now going back to the boundary conditions action panel, we will proceed with applying the boundary conditions for this problem. The first boundary condition we'll be applying will be for the wall boundary family. So we will go ahead and highlight this boundary family with a single left mouse click. After that's been highlighted, we will hold down the left mouse button and we will drag and drop this into the wall category of the boundary conditions tree. For this boundary family, we will be applying a viscous wall. The wall integration will be wall functions. It will be an adiabatic wall, and it will also be stationary with respect to mesh motion. And since there is no mesh motion in this problem, this wall will be stationary. Once that's been applied, we will not be applying any additional modifiers, so we can press OK at the bottom of this panel to confirm and close. Next, we will proceed with the second boundary family, the symmetry boundary. We will once again highlight this with a single left mouse click, hold down the left mouse button, and drag and drop to the symmetry category in the boundary conditions tree. Here, we will choose to apply a symmetry boundary condition and press OK at the bottom to close the panel. Next, for the outlet boundary family, we will highlight it with a single left mouse click, hold down the left mouse button, and drag and drop to the open boundary condition category. For this boundary family, we will be applying an outflow only boundary condition. We're expecting supersonic flow at this exit, so we will not be imposing a boundary condition. So we'll uncheck that and just allow for supersonic outflow. We'll press OK to confirm and close this panel. Finally, we will highlight the inlet boundary family with a single left mouse click. We will hold the left mouse button and drag and drop again to the open boundary condition category. But we're going to be creating a new open boundary condition, so we will make sure not to place it in the same boundary condition as boundary condition 3, but rather in the main open 
category. For this boundary condition, we'll only be applying an inflow only boundary condition. The type of information will be pressure and temperature. We're going to be applying a reservoir condition using stagnation, pressure, and temperature. We will need to create a new information set for this boundary condition, so we will click on the plus button. Once a new information set has been created, we will highlight it with a single left mouse click, as well as checking it. For the stagnation pressure, we will be applying 2.5 E4 pascals and a stagnation temperature of 354.6 Kelvin. Once again, we will be keeping the turbulence quantities, the K and Epsilon values, at their default state. We will be initializing them at a later stage of the setup. We will not be coming in with any water droplets we're going to allow water droplets to be created in the flow due to condensation. So we'll keep all of the values for the sole EDP species at zero. We'll be choosing to use the local velocity from the inside for this boundary condition. Once everything has been set, we'll press OK at the bottom to confirm and exit. We can now check that all boundary conditions have been applied by looking at the boundary family tree in our notebook. And you'll notice that what used to be a red X next to our boundary families is now a green check, signifying that a boundary condition has been applied to that boundary family. Also, if we hover over a particular boundary family with our mouse, we can see the exact boundary condition that's been applied. We can do the same in the boundary conditions tree in our action panel. Now we can go ahead and press OK at the bottom of this action panel to proceed. In the subsequent turbulence control action panel, we will keep all the default settings and press OK at the bottom. Next, we are taken to the turbulence initialization tool action panel. Here we will finally initialize our K and Epsilon values for the two information sets that require them. We will first initialize for the primitive variables information set that was used for our initial conditions. We will highlight this with a single left mouse click. Next we are going to bring up the initialization tool with a right mouse click. For this particular problem, the turbulence length scale is known, so we'll keep that as yes. We will not use a suggested turbulence level value. Instead, we'll be applying our own value of 2e minus 2. For the length scale, we will choose to apply 1e minus 3 meters. The free stream velocity for our initialization has automatically been inputted by the information set. So once these inputs have been applied, we will press OK. And the computed K and Epsilon values have been automatically entered into our information set. Next, we will choose to copy these same K Epsilon values from our initial conditions information set to our inlet boundary condition information set. We can do this by left mouse clicking the copy informations button. This will bring up a panel where we first choose the source information set which will be the initial conditions information set that we just used to initialize our turbulence values. And the destination will be the information set for the inlet boundary condition. Next, we'll hit Apply, and then press OK. Now you'll be able to see by highlighting the information set for our boundary condition that the same K epsilon values from our initial conditions have been copied over. 
Now we can go ahead and press OK at the bottom to proceed. Next we're taken to the Help Set Numerics action panel. We will not be using this wizard to set up our numerics for this problem. We will choose to do this manually. So we can keep both options at no and press OK at the bottom to proceed. In the Remon Solvers action panel, we will be applying some additional minimum dissipation. Since this will be a supersonic flow, we will apply a pressure switch and we will choose a supersonic pressure switch. We'll keep the default values for this pressure switch and press OK at the bottom to proceed. Next in the Simulation Strategy Integration Action Panel, we will be starting this computation from scratch. So for the option of is this a restart, we will keep it as no. The integration type will be implicit. For the number of global steps for this run, we will enter 1500. And we will choose to have an eight order magnitude drop of convergence before termination based on convergence is reached. In addition to this, we will expand the advanced controls options. And we will enter a minimum number of steps for this run. So basically, we want this computation to run at least a thousand steps even if an eight order magnitude convergence drops has been reached prior to this. Once all of this has been entered, we can go ahead and press OK to proceed. Next in the time integration control action panel, we're gonna set up a CFL schedule going from one to 20 over the first 100 steps, one to 100. We will reduce the under relaxation for the EDP equations to 0 0.5. After this, we can press OK at the bottom to proceed. Next, we're taken to the spatial discretization panel. We don't need to make any changes to this panel. The dimensionality of the polynomials has already been entered for us as 2D based on the grid analysis done in the beginning. And we'll choose to solve this as second order accurate, so the order of invested discretization will, can be kept at second. No other changes need to be made, so we can press OK at the bottom to proceed. Next in the neutral plot file options action panel, we're going to the output options pull down menu and go to the category of EDP. Now down where it says dispersed phase, we're going to highlight our sole dispersed phase with a single left mouse click. And for this dispersed phase, we are going to choose to output number density, density, volume fraction, x velocity, temperature, and radius. Once that's done, we can press OK to confirm. Next, we're prompted with a panel that it will ask us to write out these output options to a neutral plot file output options input file as well as copying it to a plot output options input file. The plot output options input file is used by some of our third-party visualization exporters. So we will say OK to both of these to close this panel. We will not be making any changes to our probe and output files options, so we can keep the default values for this action panel and press OK. Now we're ready to save our input file. So with this option checked, we'll press OK. Once the input file has been saved, you will see that all of our action items in our action tree have been checked, which means that our setup is complete and we are ready to run the simulation, which we can do by going to the Tools pull-down menu in the menu bar and going down to Run CFD++. We can choose to run this in double precision mode using a single CPU. And by clicking on the Run button in our tool runner, we can proceed with the simulation. All output files from the simulation will be written to the current working directory.
For more information about visualization and post-processing, please refer to the post-processing section of this example. Thank you. In this example, we will be simulating the condensation of water vapor in a high-pressure Laval nozzle. The results will be compared to experimental and numerical results. The use of the Eulerian dispersed phase condensation module in CFD++ will be demonstrated. For this case, the entire nozzle is filled with steam and water vapor and no other species. First, we'll be selecting the working directory for our simulation. Once we've selected this, we can press OK at the bottom of this action panel to proceed. Next, in the load input grid info action panel, we will say yes to analyzing the grid files in our current working directory, as well as yes to loading in the BC family file. We can then press OK to proceed with the analysis. Once the grid analysis has completed, a grid information panel will pop up, giving information about the grid that's just been read in. This particular grid is a 2D grid with approximately 7,000 quadrilateral elements and four boundary families. We can press OK at the bottom of this information panel to close it. Next in the cell types and volumes action panel, all the necessary inputs have automatically been entered for us based on the grid analysis done in the previous step. We can proceed by pressing OK at the bottom of this action panel. For this particular example, we will be solving a general fluid problem, but we will not be using any of our preset problem class wizards, so we'll keep that option as no, and press OK at the bottom to proceed. In the CFD problem definition action panel, for the fluid type, we'll be choosing multiple phases, since we will have both water vapor and liquid water droplets in this simulation. The fluids will be missable, so we'll keep this option as yes. For the secondary phase, we will choose to treat it as a dispersed phase. For the primary phase, it will be a gas. And we only have a single primary phase species, so we'll keep that as single species. The primary phase will be compressible. And the type of gas will be a real gas. The flow speed of the primary phase will be mostly above Mach 0.5. The fluid is viscous and the flow is turbulent, but we will not be solving for any radiation heat transfer and the simulation type we will solve in steady state mode. Once these options have been entered, we will press OK at the bottom to confirm and proceed. We will not be applying any additional specifications for this problem, so we will keep all of these options in their default no state before pressing OK at the bottom of this action panel. In the equation properties action panel, the equation of state for our primary phase will be ideal gas. The turbulence model used will be the default two equation realizable k epsilon model. We will not be defining any passive scalar, so this option can be kept at no. And for the dispersed phase, we will be choosing the Eulerian dispersed phase model, EDP and there will only be a single dispersed phase species, so we'll keep that as one. The additional equations for EDP, we will add energy and number density since we will be having phase change, and we will be allowing the droplets to increase and decrease in size. We will not be applying any diffusivity for the EDP, so we can keep this option as no. Once these settings have been applied, we can press OK to proceed. We will not be applying any physics source terms to this problem, so we'll keep this option as no and press OK at the bottom of the action panel. In the reference quantities action panel, we are told that we are running this in dimensional mode and that the unit system will be in SI units. We'll press OK to proceed. Next, in the fluid properties for the primary phase, we will choose two temperature ranges and then we will go ahead and apply water vapor as our sole species. We will expand the database and scroll down and find H2O underscore water and we will highlight this with a single left mouse click. Holding down the left mouse button we will drag and drop to the hidden species tree on the right 
This will apply water vapor properties as our sole primary phase species. We will not be applying any additional settings, so we can press OK to proceed. Next in the Disperse Phase Properties panel, we will change the fluidized density reference value based on option from inlet to hole. We will highlight the information set for our sole dispersed phase with a single left mouse click and then we'll choose to edit it by pressing the edit button at the top. This will bring up the dispersed phase properties for this species. This will be water and the type of particle will be liquid. We will not be allowing for evaporation, radiation, secondary breakup, or wall impingement, so all these options can be kept at no. The specific heat of formulation will be constant. The initial particle diameter we will choose to change to 1e-9. This initial particle size is set to a number that is lower than the initial expected particle sizes in the system and has no effect on the solution as long as it is lower than the initial nucleation droplet size. One additional thing that we will change is that we will increase the maximum particle temperature from the default 373 Kelvin to 533 Kelvin. Since the flow in this case has high pressure and temperature values, it is necessary to increase the maximum particle temperature once this change has been made, we can press OK to close this panel. Next, we will choose to activate the condensation model. Since we'll be allowing the primary phase gas to change into liquid water droplets via condensation, we'll press OK to confirm and proceed. Since we activated the condensation model, we are subsequently taken to the condensation model input action panel. The condensation model type we will choose as Germathy as opposed to Hertz Knudsen. In regard to the condensation of pure steam flowing through a supersonic nozzle, the Germathy model predicts more accurate droplet sizes. We will choose a condensation model specific to water. The droplet size of the condensation can vary, so we will choose no for the constant droplet size option. We will not turn off the nucleation term, and we will not be applying coagulation, and we will not be basing the initial droplet size on the supercooling temperature ratio. For the Newton number parameter for convective heat transfer, we will choose the variable option and keep the default 9.0 parameter for the Newton number coefficient. In the Giamatti expression, droplet growth rate is obtained from an energy balance around a spherical particle, where the convective heat transfer coefficient is modified to account for Newton number effects due to the small droplet size. For this problem, we will be including non-isothermal effects on the nucleation term, and for the calculation of the saturation temper, we will be using internal fits for water. The nucleation rate coefficient we will reduce to 0.1, and the maximum condensation temperature will be increased to 600 Kelvin. All other settings can be kept in their default state and we can press OK to proceed. In the initial conditions action panel we will choose to initialize the entire domain with the temperature based information set. We'll create a new information set for this by clicking on the plus button once a new information set has been created, we will highlight it using a left mouse click as well as checking it to confirm that we'll be using this particular information set for the initial conditions. The static pressure will be entering a value of 2E6 pascals and for the static temperature we'll be entering 544.5 Kelvin. The X velocity we will enter as 100 meters per second. We will keep the turbulence quantities in their default state. We will initialize them at a later stage of the setup. We will not have any EDP particles initially in the domain, so we'll keep the dispersed phase values at zero. And press OK at the bottom to confirm and proceed. 
Next, we are taken to the boundary conditions action panel. Before proceeding with applying the boundary conditions, I would like to go over some of the basic mouse controls of the AUI interface. Moving the mouse cursor to the canvas, we can zoom in and out by holding down the right mouse button. We can translate by holding down the middle mouse button. And rotate by holding down the left mouse button. Since this is a 2D problem, we can go back to the default XY view by clicking on the XY shortcut button in the shortcut menu bar. We can also toggle on and off the 2D grid by clicking on the toggle 2D button. You can also choose to show or hide the boundaries by going to the Boundary Families tree in the notebook and with a single left mouse click, clicking on and off the grid icon next to each boundary family. Now we can proceed with applying the boundary conditions to our boundary families. First, we will do so for the inlet boundary family. We will highlight this boundary family with a single left mouse click. Then we will hold down the left mouse button and drag and drop this to the open category in the boundary conditions tree. This will bring up the boundary conditions panel for this boundary family. For the boundary condition subgroup, we will choose inflow only. We'll be applying a reservoir boundary condition here, so we'll not be allowing any reverse flow. For the type of information available, we will choose pressure and temperature and we will choose to apply stagnation pressure and stagnation temperature. We will need to create a new information set for this boundary condition. We will do so by clicking on the plus button. Once a new information set has been created, we will highlight it with a single left mouse click, as well as checking it to confirm that we will be using this particular information set. For the stagnation pressure, we will be entering a value of 2e6 pascals and for the stagnation temperature we'll be entering 544.5 Kelvin. The turbulence quantities will be kept in their default state for now. We will initialize them at a later stage of the setup. For the dispersed phase values we'll keep all values at zero. This means that we will not be coming in with any water droplets. The water droplets will be introduced into the flow due to condensation only. For the variable to use from the inside, we will choose local velocity. Once everything has been set, we can press OK at the bottom to close this panel. Next, we will highlight the sim boundary family with a single left mouse click and hold down the left mouse button and drag and drop to the symmetry boundary conditions category. Here we will apply a symmetry boundary condition to this boundary and press OK. Next for the outlet boundary family we will once again highlight with a single left mouse click and holding down the left mouse button we will drag and drop this to the open category. Please be careful not to place it into the same open boundary condition as the inlet. We will be creating a new boundary condition for this family. For the boundary conditions subgroup, we will choose outflow only. And we will not be imposing a boundary condition at this boundary since the flow will be primarily supersonic. So we will uncheck this option and apply supersonic outflow. We'll press OK to close this panel. And finally, we will apply the boundary condition to the nozzle boundary family. With a single left mouse click, we will highlight it. And holding down the left mouse button, we will drag and drop to the wall boundary condition category. Here we'll be applying a viscous wall that will utilize wall functions. It will be adiabatic and stationary. We will not be applying any of these additional modifiers, so we can leave them unchecked and press OK at the bottom. We can confirm that all boundary conditions have now been applied by going to the Boundary Families tree in our notebook. 
and we'll notice that there's a green check next to each boundary family name. Previously, before our boundary conditions were applied to a particular family, there was a red X. The green check signifies that a boundary condition has been successfully applied to this family. Hovering the mouse cursor over a particular boundary family will also display the exact conditions applied. Once this is complete, we can press OK at the bottom of the boundary conditions action panel to proceed. In the subsequent turbulence control action panel, we will keep the default settings and press OK. Next, in the turbulence initialization tool action panel, we will proceed with initializing the turbulence values for the information sets that require them. First, we will highlight the primitive variables information set used for our initial conditions with a single left mouse click. Then we'll bring up the initialization tool with a single right mouse click on this information set. In the turbulence calculator panel, we will say yes to the turbulence length scale being known. For the turbulence level, we will choose our own, so we will not use the suggested values. For the free stream turbulence level, we will set as 1e-2. For the turbulent length scale, we will choose 2e-4. And the free stream velocity has already been entered for us based on the information set that we highlighted. We will go ahead and press OK to compute the new turbulence values. You will see the new computed K and Epsilon values in the right hand side panel. Instead of initializing again for the reservoir boundary condition information set, we will choose to copy what we've initialized for the initial conditions to that information set. We can do this by clicking on the Copy Information Sets button. Here we will choose as our source the information set for the initial conditions, and as our destination the information set for the reservoir boundary condition. We will press Apply to do the copy and press OK to close this panel. Now we can proceed by pressing OK at the bottom of this action panel. For this particular example, we will not be using the Help Set Numerics wizard to apply our numerical conditions. We will keep these options as No and press OK at the bottom to proceed. In the Riemann Solvers panel, we will choose to apply additional minimum dissipation. We will apply it via a supersonic pressure switch since our flow will be supersonic. We will keep all the values and options in their default state for this pressure switch and press OK at the bottom to proceed. In the simulation strategy and integration action panel, we are going to be solving this computation from scratch so it will not be a restart. The integration type will be implicit the number of global steps for this run will be set to 5,000. And we will choose to have it drop six orders of magnitude. In addition to this, we will be expanding the advanced controls menu and applying a minimum number of steps for this run to be 1,000. What this means is that even if the residuals drop six orders of magnitude prior to reaching the first 1,000 steps, the run will continue until the first thousand steps is reached. We can press OK at the bottom to proceed. In the time integration control action panel, we will be ramping the CFL from 1 to 10 over the first 100 steps. And we will also choose to reduce the under relaxation for the EDP equations from the default 0 0.67 to 0 0.5. Once this is done, we can press OK to proceed. Next, we're taken to the spatial discretization action panel. We can leave this in the default state. The dimensionality of our grid has already been entered for us as 2D based on the grid analysis done at the beginning of the setup. We can press OK to proceed. In the Neutral Plot File Options action panel, we will go to the Output Options pull-down menu 
and enter the EDP category. Here we will highlight with a single left mouse click the properties for our sole EDP species and we will choose to output number density, density, volume fraction, x velocity, temperature, and radius. And we'll press OK at the bottom to proceed. Next we're prompted with writing out these output options into a neutral plot files options input file which we'll say yes to by keeping the check and we will also copy this to the plot output options input file which will be used when, whenever we convert our solution to a third-party visualization format. We'll press OK to close this panel. We'll keep the default probe and output file options and press OK to proceed. Finally we are asked to save the input file which we will proceed to do so by keeping this option checked and pressing OK at the bottom of this action panel. Once this is done, you will notice that all of our action items in our action tree now have a green check next to them. This means that we have completed our setup for this problem and are ready to run our simulation. We can do this by going to the Tools pull-down menu in the menu bar and selecting Run CFD++. This will bring up a Run CFD++ panel. We will choose to run this in double precision mode using a single CPU. Once we're ready to run, we'll press the Run button in the Tool Runner. This will write out our standard output into the Tool Runner window. All output files will be written to the current working directory. For more information about post-processing and visualization, please refer to the post-processing section of this example. Thank you.